Hello and welcome again to the Rider Review. This is Eric Karat Rider, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2009 adventure comedy titled Land of the Lost. Now, Land of the Lost was at one time a TV series that uh, ran on NBC Saturday mornings between 1974 to 1976. But it has came to the big screen in 2009, and it runs for an hour and 42 minutes long. It is directed by Brad Siberling. It is produced by the original makers of the show, Sid and Marty Croft, as well as Jimmy Miller. Um, the script was written by Chris Henschey and Dennis McNichol. Den McNicholas, I should say. The score was done by Michael Giacchino. The cinematography by Dion Beebe. And it was edited by Pete Teschner. And the stars of the movie are Will Ferrell, Anna Friel, Danny McBride, Yorma Taccone, uh, John Boylan, Matt Lauer, Leonard Nimoy does the voice of Zorn, and a slee stack was voiced was played by Douglas Tate. Okay, so uh, what did I think of this movie? Well, Will Ferrell once again shows his comic mastery and shows that he is truly the master of improv. And here, of course, he plays the role of the iconic uh, paleontologist from the series, the the main character, Dr. Rick Marshall, who's an arrogant scientist who has lost his bravado as his mission went on an unexpected turn of events as he and his crew which includes his intelligent research assistant, Holly, played by Anna Friel, and a redneck uh, survivalist who works as a carnival uh, operator by the name of Will, played by Danny McBride. They land in the mysterious land of the lost. You know, it was the use of some kind of Tachyon device, which could send you into time traveling. So this is a time traveling adventure. And our three protagonists are practically in the face of danger during its whole run. Even though there's a lot of uh, comedic scenarios, lots of laugh out loud moments. And I know that many, uh, many fans who have seen the movie were probably really appalled by this, this remake of a old TV show and you know many parents believe it or not were badly frowned upon this movie because of the fact that even though this was a movie that looked like it was uh, directed aimly towards the younger age demographic but what we get is a lot of potty humor in this that does not meet the criteria towards a younger audience there is swearing, there is vulgarity, there is sexual innuendo in this movie. But then again, when you think about it, this movie was never meant to be taken seriously. So for all those cynical prudes out there who thought that this movie lacked any kind of realism, well, what did you expect? Back in the 70s, Sid and Marty Croft made a lot of these kind of, kind of these surreal, uh, campy type of stuff. And it was never intended to be taken seriously. I mean, lion up, you guys. Get a life. It's, I mean, what's, what's wrong with a little bit of enjoyment? So with dinosaurs ruling the gambit and other grave dangers ahead, the trifecta are defenseless, weaponless, and need to depend on their resourcefulness to survive in a comedy homage to the Sid and Marty Croft shows based on their shows that they did in the 70s. I mean, I'm kind of glad that they chose Land of the Lost because some of the other stuff probably just would not fit the formula to appease to a modern audience. I don't think we will at any time see a HR Puffin Stuff remake. Or if not... I don't know what they would do if they ever did something like that. I think there was also a Sid and Marty Croft show that they could probably end up doing. 
Uh, there was one that actually had Bob Denver in it. I don't remember the name. I can't think of it, the name at the moment. When I go on IMDb uh, or Wikipedia, I'll probably know which one it is. I know Bob Denver of Gilligan's Island, famous in uh, one of the Sid and Marty Crofts. When I think it had something to do with space, but I don't. I can't think of the name at the moment. If anybody who knows the name of the of the, of the TV series that Bob Denver was in, you know, let me know. I'm all open. I'm all open for discussion. So anyways, uh, with a formula that will surely make Ed Wood green with envy, the nostalgia factor truly speaks volumes. This truly did get that feeling of being in a, the surrealist world of Sid and Marty Crofts. The nostalgia makes you just go back to the 70s. Sure, I know there's a bit of a change in characters, especially between the characters of Will and Holly. Uh, in the TV series, uh, Will and Holly, played by uh, Wes, Wesley, Col Wesley Urey and Kathy Coleman, they, um, were father they were the son and daughter of Dr. Rick Marshall. But in this series, Will is a redneck... Uh, amusement park operator while Holly is a Cambridge alum who is studying um, tachyon research. Oh, and she also seems to understand the language of the ancient language that the Pakunis are speaking. For those who probably never seen the series, the Pakunis they're almost kind of like like prototypes of Bigfoot, you know, like a cross between human and ape or some form of prehistoric ape-like creatures that have not fully evolved into full-blown humans. I like to think of them as kind of like mini Bigfoots. And throughout the course of this speech... Throughout the course of my review, I'm going to probably refer to the Pakunis. Anyhow, uh, it seems kind of strange that Holly actually seems to understand the Pakuni language. Uh, one of the flaws, I guess, about this movie is how did she ever understand the language? I mean, it probably was a language that's just as extinct as the Neanderthals or the Cro Magnons. But for some strange reason, she seems to understand their language. Uh, you know, of course, when it came to the vulgarity and the sexual innuendos, yeah, okay, I do have to admit it was a little bit not exactly quite aimed towards children. But then again, the immaturity, the childishness, and the cartoony humor should be enough for a kid to enjoy and for an adult who's got the kid in them could also enjoy a movie of this of this genre um, of course such sexual innuendos you see of course um, the leading Pakuni his name is Chaka played by Yorma Takoni many times you often see him uh, touch Holly's breasts there's also some scenes where uh, Will actually dumps dino piss all over his face. There was also a graphic scene where Dr. Rick um, gets swallowed by a T-Rex. And then the T-Rex defecates him out, which is gross. Yes, there is a lot of sick humor in this. And maybe it may not appeal or may be appropriate for the younger audience. But then again... The Sid and Marty Crofts thing was probably something that even kids probably wouldn't have understand. And there was probably a lot of adult innuendo there too. Also, I guess you could say if you want to throw in some lesser offensive innuendos, uh, what was the significance of Holly ripping off her pants into making them into shorts? I mean, isn't she afraid of mosquito bites? He's out in the wilderness. 
and to be, you know, less exposed, it's not always a, a, a great move on her part. Uh, there were some parts that I also thought was quite humor, especially the cameo from NBC News journalist Mr. Matt Lauer actually appears in this uh, movie. Uh, he's at the beginning scenes belittling um, Dr. Marshall's um, scientific and scientific discovery that the use of tachyons could be uh, utilized to uh, go back in time, like a time travel apparatus. He also appears at the end when Rick Marshall has proven that his uh, device actually works. So then... Uh, once he returns back to normal civilization, then again, what civilization has ever been normal? Anyhow, he appears once again on The Tonight Show, and he has written a book. And he wanted Matt Lauer to, to read the cover of the book. And the book said... Matt Lauer can suck it. Of course, this this really pisses off Matt Lauer, and Matt Lauer ends the and the movie just ends with Matt Lauer practically beating the shit out of Doctor Rick. There was a lot of funny laugh out loud moments, and I don't see why kids would be offended. I think it was the adults who were more offended by this movie because their beloved show that they watched when they were kids growing up has been turned into a remake with all kinds of inconsistencies and all kinds of editing and all kinds of uh, a remake, reboot bullshit. That I think it was the adults that I think that were the ones that were pissed off more than the kids. I've... Actually, had seen kids come out of the movie and they didn't seem phased out by the toilet humor and the vulgarity. It seemed like the adults were the ones that were the were that were that were complaining the most about the movie. When I came out of the movie, I was actually I actually had a time of my life. I had a lot of fun watching it. Yes, okay, maybe it did not go exactly like the TV series. But then again, I never thought this movie insulted my intelligence because there was nothing intelligent to insult about. The movie just did not have intelligence. It was stupid, and it knew it was stupid. So by putting stupid characters in stupid situations, it made the movie all the more enjoyable. Get a life. Get a life and take the stick out of your asses and enjoy life. So the campy nature looks like it was filmed in someone's backyard, but it never looked better as it defied itself from any conventional expectations as our protagonists face with Grumpy the T-Rex. Many of the scenes that involve Grumpy the T-Rex was some of the best, most hottest things. I mean, here we see our three protagonists running away from a giant 40-foot carnivorous dinosaur. And one of the running gags throughout this is that every time Dr. Rick says that a T-Rex may stand 40 feet tall with big teeth and the desire to eat humans like a light snack... He kept insinuating that dinosaurs are big, but they, but their brains the size of a walnut. And of course, this totally pisses off Grumpy the T Rex, as um, because he's kind of different from the other kind of T Rexes. He's a T Rex who seems to come across as being pretty sensitive. I mean, it took almost near the end of the scene where he actually goes down into 
Grumpy's belly where he cleans out some kind of intestinal blockage and then gets crapped out of him. Must have been a smelly situation. Anyhow, that scene alone is just priceless. Land of the Lost succeeds in breaking the barriers of any sort of conventional filmmaking by actually deliberately making it campy and showing no apologies about it. Besides, it was produced by Sid and Marty Croft, so they wanted to make this campy. I mean, if Sid and Marty Croft would have walked out from this project instead of actually being the producers of this movie, then this movie probably would have never materialized. Sid and Marty Croft were the producers of the creators of Land of the Lost. Cut to 35 years later, and they were back at the helm again, producing this movie. Now, if it, now Sid and Marty Croft must have wanted this movie to be like the way it, it was shown. I mean, I mean, if it would, if the production would have been done by somebody else, then this movie wouldn't have worked. I think that it, I think that Sid and Marty Croft was the reason why the film is the way it is. They wanted it to be that way. They wanted it to be that way. This is their project. This is their baby. And to have these whiners, these naysayers saying that this movie had nothing to do with the movie, that this movie had nothing to do with the TV series, then maybe you should go back and look at the credits for the TV series. It was Sid and Marty Croft. Sid and Marty Croft came back and they remade the movie. They were the brains behind the TV series in the 70s. And they are the brains and the foundation that brought the series to a live action movie 35 years later. This is a Sid and Marty Croft production. It was meant to be. And to have these people just complain saying, Yeah, this has nothing to do with the with the this has nothing to do with this with the series. Oh, the magic was lost. The magic was not lost. The magic was revitalized. Sure, they changed a bit of the characters around. Will and Holly are not their are not Dr. Rick's offspring. But but when you watch the series, you'll notice that it's just as surreal as the movie. And I think the magic was just recaptured. Maybe it may have been a way to sort of appease to the modern audience. But I just thought that everything here looked like it was taken. A lot of detail was taken from the series. So in spite of the vulgar language and the sexual references, Will Ferrell can still produce a compelling performance which will likely appeal to the material aimed for a much younger audience. When Dr. Rick and Will go incognito, dressed as members of an alien species known as the Slee Stacks, to look unconvincing as the creatures themselves, we see that they know what kind of film they've gone themselves into. And they're having the time of the light of their life while they're at it. And how they can still do things in scenes where very little is happening and make it feel like they're doing a service to his audience show that they actually really truly care about their audience and want to do everything that they can to make us care about them. If the actors care about the characters they played, 
then we as an audience should also take the initiative to care about these characters. We want them in safety. Whether they were running away from giant T-Rexes to, to, being, to being under the threat from an evil alien race. We care about them. And the reason why we care about them is because they care about the roles they're playing. And if they could play off character roles that they care about, then we, as an audience, should care about them. Even through all the most surreal moments, we could still find that little bit of reassurance from our three protagonists in hopes that they could get back to modern civilization safely in one piece. Okay, maybe they went overboard to do everything they can to make us care about. I mean, who can ever forget the scenes where Chaka feeds, feeds Rick and Will a concoction that um, that is so intoxicating that they go on some kind of a hallucinating um, trip of some sort, you know. They go, they're like, they're, they're stoned. So they go on some kind of an acid trip. And of course you can hear in the background Jimi Hendrix's all along the watchtower. So I think maybe that part they may have went a little bit overboard. But then again, hey... Do you think that Sid and Marty Croft were tripping when they were making these campy television series on NBC back in the 70s? Maybe. Maybe this is still just part of the whole 70s vernacular. That maybe when they were coming up with these crazy creative stories that that was in their warped imagination. Maybe that was just a bit of a... of a metaphoric uh, wink to the audience. So, I guess for a kid's flick, Land of the Lost may be at times a bit whacked out. But it's still fun. It's still fun to watch. And I think it was badly misunderstood. Sure, they make no bones about it that this movie is definitely an homage to the Sid and Marty Croft TV, TV special that ran from 1974 to 1976. I had a chance to peruse through the show on YouTube. And unless you can understand the 70s humor or understand the satirical jokes it has to offer, this series would do no justice. You sort of have to get a better understanding of the, um, of the humor that was utilized in the 70s because they brought it back there 35 years later. So unless you can understand the 70s humor or understand the satirical jokes it has to offer, this series would do no justice. Will Ferrell and Danny McBride were definitely hilarious here. And the scenes were just truly fun and exciting. It can be a bit overly done in terms of surrealism. And though it may not be everyone's cup of tea, obviously it got a pretty low grade score on Rotten Tomatoes. From a child's perspective, it's got everything a kid would want to see. Even if there is some potty humor and vulgar language. It has 
crazy adults. I mean, it has dinosaurs. It has aliens. It has Bigfoot-like hybrids. Who's like the archetypical character to our protagonists. I might be of the minority here, but I think that if you fend off the naysayers and not get caught up in high expectations, I think kids and adults should enjoy this film. You don't have to agree with me, but, you know, give it a shot. Give it a go. What harm can it do? So for that in mind, I give Land of the Lost out of 10. I give it an 8. So I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. Just remember, be kind, be courteous, and don't be rude. And I will be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Karat Writer saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.